Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jen and welcome to another episode of Blockchain Banter. Uh, we are joined by Stefan Loesch, Senior Advisor to Bancor and Carbon DeFi, along with Dr. Mark Richardson, Bancor and Carbon Project Lead. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. So, um, I mean, if you're at all involved in DeFi, you have at least heard of sandwich attacks. Um, I didn't realize, you know, it's already this year close to $175 million in losses on Ethereum alone due to sandwich attacks. And you guys have done an incredible amount of really in-depth research lately into AMMs and sandwich attacks and have released a series of research articles focused on your findings, right? Stefan, I'm thinking... Um, your article, Carbon, the MEV Sandwiches Toast, was what really kind of kicked this off, the first in the series. Right. I'm going to pin it to the top. Maybe you wouldn't mind starting us off and telling us a little bit about that. Yeah. So firstly, it is obviously motivated by carbon, but it's not quite a carbon talk in the sense that the, the first thing to understand is that typically carbon traders will be makers. And so in any case, makers will not be affected by MEV. So what we're talking about here is people taking a position against the um, uh, people taking uh, from the liquidity that, that is provided on carbon or any um, any other place. So it is probably worth talking about quickly about sandwich attacks first. They're effectively what in traditional finance is front running, but the beauty with um, with DeFi is that you can guarantee that the front running works provided you are in a privileged position. Um, this is why it's called MEV. It used to be called minor extractable value. Now people realize that there's other privileged operators, so now it's called maximum extractable value. But it's essentially everyone who controls the sequencing of the transaction on the blockchain can profit from this. In the traditional finance market, this in theory already uh, also exists, but there are laws against it. Um, in DeFi, we somehow need to deal with it. Um, and what really what happens in a sandwich attack is that someone submits a transaction against uh, against an AMM, someone else front runs it, which means that the person who submitted the transaction sees a worse price than they um, they, they 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 expected to get, um, and then the person who front runs them also back runs it. And the beauty for the front runner back runner in DeFi compared to tradition, traditional finance is that you can put this all into a package. It can't go into an atomic transaction because there's three differently signed transactions. But still, if you're a sequencer, then you um, you can do this. And effectively, the person who submitted the transaction, if they lose ten thousand dollar on the execution at the trade. Then this person who did the sandwich makes the ten thousand uh, dollar on the trade. Uh, Mark, did I leave anything out there in the transaction in in this explanation? No, uh, I didn't. I don't think you left anything out um, that's important. I'd say that the um, the most important thing though is that uh, like to recognize that when you're performing a sandwich attack, it requires um, privileged information, which is something that Stefan did speak to already. But that, you know, it's, it's I, I think, very, very um, important just to contextualize the discussion that sandwich attacks is something that are performed at the block building stage. It's not generally something that DeFi participants will perform against each other, at least not typically. Yeah, so exactly. That's a sequencer or now other people. But this is why it used to be called minor extractable. Uh, minor extractable value. And we, let's to give a bit of background, 
uh, when Mark and I were in Paris, we were discussing MEV and stuff. It's obviously a hot topic uh, with a lot of projects um, that we um, that we met there. And we were explaining how on carbon, their MEV is actually not a problem, not even for the taker. And what I did is I wrote, I, I put the gist on these discussions in these uh, in this first blog post, and then Mark took it a step further, and he looked actually at the actual formulas that um, that come out of it. So the high level here is, and then I think I hand over to uh, to Mark. The high level is that if you have gas costs. Or fees, then sandwich attacks are not costless. Now, gas costs tend to not be an issue, and we ignore them uh, because generally, on interestingly sized transactions, even though gas looks pretty bad, it is usually still relatively small. It's a fixed cost, so it's kind of well, fixed. It doesn't depend on the volume on the trade volume, so for big trades, it doesn't matter. And we are more interested in big trades um, than in small trades here, because this is where the profit or the loss opportunities uh, lie. Um, and now the intuition is here that fees prevent sandwich attacks. Why do they do that? Um, in order to well, also fees prevent and fees prevent sandwich attacks, and highly liquid AMMs prevent sandwich attacks. Why that? A sandwich attack relies on the pre-sandwich transaction pushing the market price into an area where the actual transaction, the payload transaction, sees a very different price and making money of the price difference times the volume of the other transaction. Um, but <clears throat> this means you need to have a transaction that is big enough to meaningfully push, um, push the price. Now, obviously, if you have a lot of liquidity, then you need to make a very, very, very big transaction to push the price. There's no relationship between the size of the transaction that is being sandwiched and the sandwiching transaction. The sandwiching transaction pushes the price and the other transaction just uh, just takes it. But then obviously the gain is price difference times the volume of the sandwiching um, um, of the sandwich uh, of the transaction that is being sandwiched. And it is clear that if you have a really, really um, liquid market, if you have a lot of liquidity sitting uh, sitting there, then you need to turn a really big wheel to push the prices, um, um, to push the prices. And then this big wheel, this big transaction is multiplied with the fee. And this is your cost of the sandwich attack. You pay it twice um, on the way in, on the way out. And this is essentially what it costs you. Now, you don't give this to the person sandwiched unless they are in some kind of MEV secure um, execution environment. But um, still, it's a cost that you incur. And if you're a rational operator, what we assume is that you will only sandwich if the cost of pushing the market is smaller than what you can gain by the transaction that that you um, have there. And I think I'll give over to Mark because he looked um, at a little bit uh, more detail at these formulas. Uh, what are the um, yeah, under which conditions or how it depends on fees, how it depends on the trade size and, and, and all these kind of things. Yeah, certainly. So I think um, maybe the, a good place to start is to um, re-examine the actual mechanism um, of performing a sandwich attack, um, sort of in um, you know, in the the clearest possible terms. 
And then we can also look at what I consider to be a sort of a reductionist perspective on it. Um, but the example that I speak about in um, in the, the first article um, is to basically just consider a, a situation where there's a, a user um, who sees that there is a, a liquidity pool with ETH and USDC in it um, with about $2 million worth of, of liquidity in there. Um, who is looking to swap about 20 ETH at about the $2,000 price point. Um, and after slippage, you would expect, um, if there's a 0.3% pool fee there, that they would be receiving about 38,000 um, and change in USDC. Um, so, you know, nominal value of that ETH is, is 40,000. And of course, you know, when you're swapping it, you have to pay the slippage. Um, which is why they get um, slightly less than that. Uh, but if we assume that this is the um, the expected outcome, right, that the user understands how um, constant function market making works, um, then this is kind of a good yardstick that we can use to, um, you know, compare the the rest of the results. So what's uh, what's interesting here is that, um, and what Stefan has sort of alluded to, is that you can. Um, determine a, um, a formula, and we'll get into this a bit later, for exactly um, how much the sandwich attacker should spend in order to exploit the person who's performing the trade. Um, so for now, I'm going to skip over that little detail and just go through the mechanism here. Um, so in this particular case, um, the, the sandwich attacker, he can see what the, uh, what the transaction is that's floating around in the mempool. Um, so he's going to include it inside his block. And so he can see that the user is trying to swap 20 ETH. Um, and if you perform a, a calculation there, the, the sandwich attacker will conclude that he is most optimal, most profitable, um, if he front runs that transaction with 681.4 ETH. So this is going to dramatically change the, um, the valuation of the ETH that the... Um, that the, the victim is going to receive from that liquidity pool. So the first step is that the uh, the attacker is going to swap you know 680 and change in ETH um, for about 575,000 USDC. So the the price of that ETH has has been dramatically changed on the on the liquidity pool. Then, if we allow the uh, the users trade through that original 20 ETH trade on that same liquidity pool. Um, at this new adjusted state, um, still paying um, only the 30 basis point fee, they will only receive about 7,000 USDC um, from that transaction, which is a pretty big change. Remember that they were expecting 38,000 and they're only getting seven. Um, so it's a, a big change. Now, at this point in the analysis, you might think, well, that's weird like you know why front someone why why front run someone's trade like that if um you know you have to pay all that slippage yourself but this is why the the third step in the mechanism is so important which is that at least for the purpose of this analysis all i do is i take the the total amount that the attacker has received during that front running transaction so in this case the 575,000 usdc and then they swap it back against the pool after the user's transaction has already gone through. So in this particular case, um, the attacker, um, after having allowed the user's transaction through the pool after their front run, is then going to swap back the 575,000 USDC, and they will receive uh, 693 ETH um, in the process. And the, the difference between those two numbers, the amount that the, the attacker front run with and the amount that he was able to retrieve during the back running step is about 12.3 ETH, um, which is pretty significant. Um, and, you know, if you sort of, uh, if you have a look at the, you know, the machine that's being built here and sort of realize that it has unnecessary components, that there's actually an easier way to describe it. And this is that the, um, the user who submits their transaction to the mempool for 20 ETH, um, if that's discovered by someone who wants to attack them, you can describe the entire attack process this way, which is a little bit simpler. The attacker simply just steals 20.3 ETH from that, sorry, 12.3 ETH from that transaction, leaving the user with about 7.7, .7, right? So they submitted 20 to the, to the transaction. The attacker takes 12.3 out of that, and so there's only 7.7 .7 left. Then we can um, achieve the same end result by then hiking the, the pool fee, which started at 0.3%, 
and move it all the way to 53%, almost 54%. And so that, you know, diminishing amount of ETH that they're left with um, compared to the amount that they started, not only do they are they trading less, but they also have to pay a much higher fee on the pool. Um, and so if you allow that, um, you know, this adjustment, um, it kind of simplifies the overall process. You, you, still, you still see that the attacker ends up with exactly 12.3 ETH, um, and that the user, um, you know, ends up swapping uh, 7.7 for that 7,000 USDC at the end of the process. Um, so, you know, I think that this really does help to capture the the theft um, by the attacker, but it also um, uh, sort of underscores the effective benefit to the LPs, ironically. And you, you would have seen this, um, you know, broadcast a couple of times on Twitter over the last week, that sandwich attacks actually does make liquidity providers a little bit more profitable um, because of the, um, the amplified um, volume and the fact that both the attacker and the victim have to pay fees to the liquidity pool um, in order to interact with it. Um, so this analysis and this, you know, this idea of... Um, you know, hiking the pool fee, or like even in a simulated context, um, it, it it helps to capture what the value is there for the for the LPs. Um, even though they're receiving, you know, essentially a, a smaller trade in the first place, the um, the increased um, pool fee is is pretty dramatic. Um, okay, so why does the um, you know how is it that that um, that the attacker um, is able to profit from this? You have to realize that um, essentially during that front running step, what the attacker has done is to give the uh, the person that they are exploiting a dramatically reduced price quote with respect to the ETH that they're trying to sell. Right. So the uh, you know according to the liquidity pool at the time that the user trades, even though they were expecting that thirty eight thousand ETH, uh, sorry that thirty eight thousand USDC in return for the ETH that they're trading, the new price quote is only seven thousand. And the the reason that price quote is there is because these are deterministic machines, right? After the uh, the the front runner has dumped all of that ETH into the pool, um, very very easy to achieve sort of an arbitrary um, an arbitrary price quote. Yeah, this is like this is why it is so important to compare to this trap fee thing. In traditional finance, you can also do this. So this is what high frequency traders do all the time. They see transactions coming in, filtering through the system, um, and they try to get ahead of this. Try to essentially rather what what in traditional finance what you would do you would when someone there's a big buy order coming in you would buy ahead of this big buy order and then you would sell back to this particular buy order and then make your money that way. But obviously these things don't always work uh, because someone else might interlope you or something like this. And this is the beauty for the attackers of DeFi, that, for, for these attacks in DeFi, that you can manipulate the prices and you know that it works or if for some reason it doesn't work, then well, you don't do it and then it's nothing, nothing lost. Sorry, Mark, uh, go ahead. No, that's fine. I'm good. Thank you for stepping in. And so there's an important question here, which is that, like, who is paying for what? And um, there's more than one um, valid perspective on it. You could, for example, take the stance that both the attacker and the victim um, are forced to, to pay fees for this. Um, but with the analysis that I've provided in that first article, what I'm trying to... Um, I guess what I'm taking is more of sort of the, you know, it's the, the physical organic chemist in me, um, basically treating everything like a state function, which is that it's pretty trivial to show that if the attacker began with essentially nothing and ends up with more value than they haven't paid anything. So from my perspective, it's the victim that is paying both the attacker and the liquidity providers. And it's, um, it, it's in because of that, that you can kind of get a, a much better intuition for just how dramatic the um, the value loss is in these systems. But a more nuanced view is that the um, the attacker does have to, um, you know, the amount of value sort of lost due to the inefficiency of the system from their perspective is non-zero. 
Um, and that means that, you know, within a feeless situation, the, the amount of value that they can extract is essentially infinite. Um, well, it, it's, uh, it's limited only by the, the trade size that the user is committing to. Um, and so any fee amount that's added there is kind of being deducted from the amount that they could potentially take from the user, which is all of it. And that means that there is a threshold, right? There are going to be certain parameters where the um, where the uh, the attacker does not have an opportunity, right? Whether the um, the liquidity in the pool is too large or the the fee is um, is too large, right? And there's going to be some matrix that describes um, how each of these variables kinds of affects the um, the uh, the profitability of the attacker. And this is um, essentially the um, the theme of the um, of the first article. St St Stefan, I can see you've unmuted yourself. Did you have something you wanted to add to him? No, no, I'm just. Uh, I'm in a quiet environment, so I'm just. Uh, I'm just unmuted. Sure. Um, okay. So the um, I think that the it's probably a a good point um, to now sort of address exactly how you can calculate what the profits of the um, the attacker is. And for anyone that has, um, you know, even a rudimentary knowledge of, of AMMs, constant product AMMs in this case, um, it's pretty easy. What I would suggest to do, and, you know, you should, you absolutely need to include the fee in this calculation, um, is just set up a, you know, a couple of cells, um, put in some amount of, um, of a, a user's trade that they are expecting to trade, and then just, you know, front run it, allow the trade through um, in like a separate cell and then back run it um, with the amount that you got out of the first cells calculation. Um, and that's basically where I started. And I think that this is, you know, that there are some naive aspects to this. Um, and I do point this out in the article that there are more, more sophisticated versions um, of this attack, including, um, you know, uh, liquidity manipulation, including um, combining a sandwich attack with an arbitrage trade, um, which is something that I think Eigenfi has actually pointed out recently that um, some sandwich attackers are, are not very good at. Um, but in this particular system, all I'm doing is saying that what's the, you know, how do you get the the biggest steal? How do you take the most of the user's tokens um, from the amount that they're planning to trade with the pool? Um, and so what you do is basically just nest all three of those swap equations together and you get some very, very ugly, um, you know, looking, um, looking function um, that I've just called Q, which is, uh, you know, it tells you the precise number, not uh, as a fraction, but the, the, the total amount um, of tokens that you're going to be stealing from the transaction from the, the sandwich attacker's perspective. Now, that nested function is is pretty difficult to um, to analyze. And so what I've done is to refactor it, um, which is nice because it also cancels out um, one of the reserves of the pool. You only need to know um, what the total number of tokens is in the reserve that's being traded against, which is which is pretty good. Um, and that function is is awful, right? It's a it's a very very large um, expression, and um, even though I've gone to um, you know I, I put some work in to try and factor it in a way that I think is intuitive, because the fee is applied three times, you end up with um, sort of a, a necessarily um, you know arduous expression. There's just no way around that. But if you take that that function and then um, plot it as a, um, you know, well, you, if you take that expression, I should say, and then plot it as a function of the front running amount, what you get is this very interesting polynomial. Um, it's, it's quartic, which is very unfortunate because solving a quartic isn't too much fun. Um, but it does allow you to do, um, you know, to, to analyze it via conventional methods. And what we're looking for is essentially um, this peak, right? This, um, this point where there is a, a maximum amount of, um, of value extracted from the user. Um, and so what I've done um, in that article is to basically say that if there exists a trade amount where um, the partial derivative of Q with risk with respect to the front running trade is zero, then it should obey this this quartic formula. Um, and then after solving that quartic formula, you essentially end up with again, it's a it's a horrific expression, but one that's not at all difficult for um, for for modern computers to to deal with. And since a lot of these calculations are, are you know well, 
actually all of these calculations are happening off chain during a during a sandwich attack it's really it doesn't matter how complicated these expressions get sorry uh stefan did you i saw you <laughs> i saw your um your audio spike no 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 all good all good okay perfect um okay so yeah um the that's that's basically the purpose of the um the the first article is if you wanted to be the world's best sandwich attacker right and you wanted to um extract every last way of value from um from a user's trade what is the correct sandwich attack right not not to approximate it not to sort of get you in the ballpark but literally you know, down to the very last decimal place, um, what is the correct amount to, to front run with such that your profits are the absolute maximum? What's the, the biggest number of tokens that you can steal? Um, the, and that, yeah. go ahead. So this was actually something that did interest me, that, that did surprise me, because when I wrote the first article, my assumption was kind of that on a... Um, that the bigger the better yeah so that you can on a traditional amm that you really can front run uh, a lot this was probably a, a bit of a naive trend uh, naive assumption because obviously the reality is that if this would be the case then you you would be seeing front running all over the place and it would just be massive transactions but i have to say it's something that i said oh wow that's actually cool that there is sort of a maximum and there is actually an optimum front running size beyond which what you pay in additional fees is not worth what you have in additional gains and it obviously depends on the fee level and it will almost certainly be proportional to the um to the amount of the um, initial trade uh, putting in but that there's such maximum is actually very, very, I, I thought this was a very, very interesting result that at least naively thinking, I absolutely did not expect. Yeah, it was, um, I think it's the kind of thing that you, you know, it's very hard to intuit through some of these. And I actually made this point, um, I think in the second article, which is that, you know, occasionally, you know, like intuition and uh, sort of gut feelings for things can only get you so far. Eventually, you just have to like just do a very hard calculation. And in some cases, you know, with these sandwich attacks, the calculations are very hard. Um, but anyone who wants to um, to study this further, the medium articles that I've produced actually have a um, a, a code block um, at the end, which is a uh, just a Python class. Um, that's got all of the um, all of the functions built into it that will allow you to perform these calculations yourself. So don't feel like you need to transcribe all of this stuff out of the articles. That would be a huge waste of time. You can just uh, use the um, the class methods that I've that I've put there, and you know you can do a lot of um, further research with it. So at the at the end of this first article, um, which was really again just focusing on like um, what's the the maximum profitability of a sandwich attack. I actually I asked two questions um, for people that wanted you know that were paying attention, and the first one is that if you imagine this same situation right where there's a, a liquidity pool with some balance of ETH in it, and it has some swap fee, what's the maximum amount of ETH that a user can swap without exposing themselves to a sandwich sandwich attack? Because what this function is revealing is that there's actually an un unsandwichable margin where um, any uh, attempted sandwich attack, sure, it's going to like, you, you can still, uh, you know, wreck the user who's attempting to trade, but the sandwich attacker will also be um, similarly affected, right? That they won't be able to end up with a, um, a profit at the end of performing the attack. Um, and so that was the that was the first question. What's the maximum amount the user can trade given you know some um, you know some generic liquidity pool settings? And then the second question is that um, for again, for some generic liquidity pool, um, but where the um, the total liquidity in that liquidity pool and the amount that the user is wanting to trade are fixed or known, what is the biggest or what is the sorry, the the smallest fee? That, that pool should charge in order to make a sandwich attack impossible. 
Um, and the you know the information um, in that article is obviously a really great place to to start. Um, and this formed the the basis for the um, you know my second um, my second installment on this, which is basically looking at what point out that you switch the order of your articles. So we are told what Mar what Mark is talking about now is the equations two, three, four in his second medium article. And so here, but here number one is fees, number two is um, the small warp amount, and number three is um, is the liquidity pool size. And I want to point out that these are really the most interesting formulas, as I see, that Mark got there. All the other stuff is super, super complicated. These are still not super easy, but they are really the essence of what he just said. Um, so formulas two, three, four are really the core formulas to look at um, when you want to apply this as opposed to understand it, when you understand you want to do everything. But these are really the most important formulas in this uh, in this document, in my view. So the, the method for getting there, um, and I'm referring to formula four, in the in the first article, which is this horrible um, quartic expression, what you have to realize is that if the um, you know if the the maximum um, for the front running trade, right, or if the 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 the, the correct front running trade that nets you the the most profit um, is at zero then this quartic formula actually simplifies down quite a bit. And all you end up with, like the only thing that you have to deal with is that sort of D coefficient um, right at the end um, or the constant term um, and just solve for that at zero, which is much easier. I mean, it's still kind of gross because it's, um, you know, some of those expressions are still uh, quartic. Uh, some of them are cubic. Um, but the way that it factors is really, really nice. So you don't need to apply any of those um, awful, you know, um, awful formulas in order to solve them. The the answers really just kind of fall right out. Um, and as Stefan said, yeah, this gives you equations two, three, and four in the second article. Um, and these are the interesting parts. Um, I've plotted them um, in like uh, in three D um, from Matplotlib, so you can kind of. Uh, look at those. The these um, these plots, by the way, are, are high res. So if you just click on them in your browser, they should um, you know blow up and um, and be a lot more readable than the little sort of thumbnail that you get in the the medium article itself. Mark, so the explain this in sub in. Yeah, that's a good point. The way you want to express it, but it's also it's actually pretty easy once you understand what you mean with it. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Okay. So the um, yeah the the way that um, equations two, three, and four in the second article are constructed, um, if you were to kind of read this in words, right, is that if there exists um, a front running amount equal to or less than zero, such that the partial derivative of the amount that the attacker is taking from the trader with respect to the amount that he's front running with is equal to zero. I know that that's a mouthful, but it just means that you know if there's an amount where the optimum trade is zero, then these three fun these three expressions have to be true. Now the um, you know it, it would be tempting to just say, well, you know then the the fee amount should be equal to this or the you know the user's transaction amount should be equal to this. but you have to realize that it's not an exact number, right? If you're calculating a fee where this thing is true, then technically any fee above that level is also not going to be sandwich attackable. So we're using the um, the, the infimum, which means that if there's a set um, of fees where a sandwich attack is, is not possible to perform, then the smallest value within that set is equal to this thing. And that's what infimum means or inf delta in this case. Um, in with respect to the um, the the pool's liquidity, um, inf is also the the correct way to think about it, meaning that um, there is some uh, minimum amount of liquidity that must be there um, in order to prevent a sandwich attack. But any amount of liquidity greater than that uh, will also be um, will be resistant to sandwich attacks, or actually, where you know sandwich attacks are, are completely not profitable. Um, the sup. Um, 
uh, notation means supremum, um, and this is kind of the opposite. So, and this is uh, this applies to equation three when we're thinking about the am amount of um, of ETH, for example, that the user is trading into that pool. So, if they're going to avoid being sandwich attacked then what we're really asking is what is the maximum amount that they can swap without being sandwich attacked? And so again, if there's a set of, um, of swap amounts that are all um, unsandwichable, then the supremum is the largest member of that set. So the, the maximum swap value that's resistant to sandwich attacks. That's sort of there. That is really, that's super important financial understanding. So if it works for a certain fee, it also works for a bigger fee. If it works for a certain liquidity, it also works for a bigger liquidity. If it also work, if it works for a trade, it also works for a smaller trade. Yeah, for smaller trades. I wanted to say that the, the, the formula three for the smaller trade is very interesting. So what is so the Three tells you the very interesting thing is what is the biggest trade that I can make without running risk of being sandwiched, which for me as a trader is the interesting question, right? So what is the lowest fee? As a trader, I can't influence it. Um, but you can influence the trade size um, that you can do. And obviously, when you look at the numerator of this thing, the first thing you see is an X. Yes, in an empty pool, you can't trade. This is understandable. Um, the next term is two delta, delta being the fee. So, which also means is that with zero fee, there is no amount that cannot be sandwiched. So, so this this number is going to be zero. Any trade can be sandwiched if there is no fee. However, if there is a fee then there will be a minimum amount that is not sandwichable. And this is a really nice result already falling out uh, um, of those equations that you can just plug this in and you, you, you just plug the numbers in and you say, what is the amount um, that, uh, that I can trade? And by the way, this is obviously proportional to X x being the pool size essentially you could also put the x on the left hand side then you would get delta x over x so you would say the percentage the, the maximum trade as a percentage of the pool size is a function on the right hand side of the fee this function is a bit complicated but in first order it's linear so if you have zero fee you can't trade at all without being sandwiched but with a fee bigger zero, there is a certain percentage of the pool that, pool that you can safely trade. And this, I think, financially, is a really, really nice result. So that you can do this was kind of posited in uh, my first Medium post. But here, equation three gives you how big can I trade in relation to pool size, delta x over x, as a function of the fee. So that's almost, for the user, question three is the most interesting question. Uh, the equation three is the most interesting equation for an actual user in the entirety of the paper, of all the four, uh, of all the four articles written, I would say. Yeah, and there's actually, there's more than one way to factorize the um, equations three and four. Um, the reason I've presented them the way that I have is that you can pretty easily see that they are pretty much the reciprocal of each other, except that there's a, a lone X in the numerator for equation three um, and a um, DXU um, in the numerator for equation four. And so if you um, if you divide those out by, um, by sub XU or by infex, then you actually end up with the same expression. Um, it's just that one is the reciprocal of the other. And so that was kind of the, the next logical step. As Stefan said, this even just makes intuitive sense because, you know, the um, the trade size should always be sort of expressed as a function of the size of the liquidity pool or the liquidity pool size should be expressed as a, um, a function of the trade size. And so this means that you can kind of condense 
um, the uh, equations uh, three and four um, into equation seven, where um, I've just defined this this new variable R to be the uh, essentially the the size of the liquidity pool divided by the size of the trade. And so when R is uh, a very large number, this means that the pool is much larger than the user's trade size. And when R is you know, a, a number less than one or close to zero, this means that the uh, user's trade size is much, much larger than the liquidity that they're trading against. And you know, the, you can apply sort of common sense to these things and, and sort of uh, posit that certain trade sizes are so ridiculous that they, you know, they shouldn't really be considered and that we're sort of leaving the realm um, of what we would consider practical analysis. But the point that I'm trying to get to here is more of the, um, the, the complete um, algebraic um, you know, description for this system. And it's still worth uh, looking at how some of these things perform, even in extreme situations, so that we can get the, the most complete understanding for, uh, for how sandwich attacks work. The other thing that I would like to, I like with the R, the formulas look nicer with R, but financially I, I prefer 1 over R, because 1 over R is delta X over X which on the one hand is what is the what percentage of liquidity are you trading? So it's a very intuitive thing. If the pool has 100 million of liquidity uh, in this one token X, um, obviously it has another 100 million as a, if it's a normal concept product pool, there's another 100 million other token, but that's the X, X liquidity. You're trading 1% of the X for liquidity, then delta X over X is, is 1%, and R would be I 100 the other thing, what 1 over R is, 1 over R is actually the slippage that your trade generates. Yeah, um, because we know that this is just something that we know in the when you do the, the calculation in the constant uh, product case, that the slippage on a pool is delta, uh, delta X, um, delta X over X. And so if you look at equation seven and we turn it around, so we look at one over R and ignore the inf, the inf would become a sub, but uh, um, we see that the slippage is proportional to the fee. Um, to, uh, propo and it's actually two times fee, um, which is very intuitive because Remember, sort of, so in the first order, in the other order, there's something in, because this, um, the 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 um, the slippage is what you earn, yeah, as a as a trader, as a, as a sandwicher, you earn the slippage because this puts this pushes your price, but you, what you pay is two times the fee, uh, you pay it on the way in and on the way out, yeah, and so this is very very pretty that in first order you find here just something what, that what you kind of intuitively would expect, that the slippage equal two times uh, uh, two times the fee. Um, and this is sort of the, the kind of um, analysis that I've done in the, um, in the fourth medium post where we, look, uh, where, where, where we look at these things. But these formulas, while they're super complicated, well, super complicated, but they're pretty complicated for stuff that people are normally looking at, they are actually, at least in first order, very, very intuitive, um, even though, and I think Mark is going to talk about in the second with equation eight, there's actually a really nice approximation uh, that is even better than this slippage equal fee kind of thing that I was just saying. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, the real sort of um, the the crux of this analysis, the thing that I think is the the most interesting, both academically and financially, is really looking at how the the fee moves um, with respect to um, to R, right? The um, the the size of the user's trade versus the 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 liquidity, or the other way around, depending on your perspective. Um, and so, uh, what I did was because the the you know equation six is pretty awful. Um, I did some asymptotic analysis on it just to see if there were um, some some nicer equations um, that it can um, that can approximate it. 
Um, and what I found was really, um, really excellent agreement. And Stefan and I have uh, spoken about this a little bit already. Um, but the, uh, the 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 short of it is that when the um, when R is bigger than um, bigger than one, meaning that the uh, the liquidity pool is at least as large as the um, the the user's trade size, um, and as the liquidity gets larger and larger, which is typically the situation that we're in, um, then the um, the infimum of the pool fee can be very well approximated by 2 over 2R two plus 3, which is really nice. Um, and you can have a look at, um, the. this is figure 4 in that second article, the yellow uh, broken line on the um, on subplot B is, the, is that approximation. Um, which comes out really, really well. That's obviously a much, much nicer expression to deal with than um, than equation six. Um, and in the you know in the opposite case, which is when the user is trying to swap um, larger amounts, then there is liquidity in the pool, which I think we will all agree is probably not something that you even really need to consider very often. Hopefully, never at all. There's still an approximation, um, and it does have this asymptotic behavior. Um, I just couldn't find, um, if there is a better approximation for it, it'll be more complicated. Um, and it kind of fails, um, you know, if, if there is a better approximation, you can't arrive at it via these typical um, asymptotic approximations. But that one is one minus the square root of R, um, which again is not too, um, not too surprising. Um, so yeah, I think we, the, the, the most important thing is that we can actually characterize um, you know, if there is a certain swap amount, given the, a liquidity pool amount, um, that there is a fee where the um, where a sandwich attack becomes impossible to perform, and that that fee um, is actually very easy to calculate. It's just two over two r plus three, um, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a, a very nice um, very nice result. And um, I think as as Stefan has just pointed out in his um, in his follow up. Um, he did discuss um, an even uh, an even more approximate case, which is basically just one over um, one over r. Yeah, exactly. So that's like the first uh, the first uh, the first chart called minimum no sandwich fee as a function of r equal x over delta x, because financially, as I say, I don't like r that much. I prefer one over r. And you see that these two over two r plus three um, for a, a big r, the three term. So the, the for for if r gets big, so one over r gets small. Um, then the three disappears, and two over two r just becomes one over r, uh, which is just delta x over x. Um, so that for me would have been the, that, that's sort of the first order approximation for really, really small trades. This is where it goes. But if you look at my chart, that is the blue line. Um, so the real line in my chart is the red line. The blue line is this one over R, um, approximation, which starts being okay, um, at X equal 10, um, so so at r so at r equal 10 so this is the um, is 10 so delta x over x equal uh, 10 percent um but the two the marks approximation is the green curve and that already starts being great from 0 0.5 so it is actually a much 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 better approximation than the financially more interesting a more intuitive one that is just, oh, well, it's just over the fees. So that's the second thing is that this 2 over 2R plus 3, I think you never, in a practical situation, you probably don't never need to go better than that. So that's really that whenever you do any analytics in this area, that's just the equation that you can use, and this covers you for pretty much every use case, which is very nice because it's obviously much easier than this delta, delta square, delta six, six, whatever things that are not too hard for a computer, but a bit hard when you, well, uh, to understand them. So it's a, it's a really nice formula and it fits really well the actual graph in the area we're interested in.
which is R big, because R small just means that we have uh, trades that are very, very big compared to the pool size, and then things are funny anyway. So then the um, the um, the last section of that second article, and I won't spend too much time on it, is basically looking at um, how you know how would it look if we applied some of these um, you know some of these uh, learnings from the analysis to that first situation that I used to describe the sandwich attack in the first place. So recall, even even just in this conversation earlier, I said that there was a you know, assume that a user is approaching a, a liquidity pool. It's got 500 ETH in it and 1 million USDC in it. Um, and the swap fee is 0.3%. We know that they're expecting to swap 20 ETH and receive 38,346 USDC. But at the end of the, um, of the process, even though that that's what their expected return is, um, they actually only get um, 7,000 and um, 7,000 and change USDC, which is about an 81.6% loss with respect to what they expected to get. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, let's see how much they could have swapped without being sandwiched. And compared to the 20 that they swapped, um, they can actually only swap 1.5. Okay. So if they swap 1.5 ETH, which is um, the supremum of the, the swap amount, they would receive um, to uh, about 3,000 USDC. So even though they're swapping like 5% of what they had initially planned to swap, they're actually receiving um, about 50% of what they would get after being sandwich attacked, which is, which is I think, an interesting result. And this is when I say that I think that some of these numbers are are so different, right? It's so unintuitive that you actually need to see the analysis performed and do the calculation, I think, to really get your bearings in, um, in just how severe sandwich attacks are. But then the more interesting analysis is, okay, let's go back and let's set the pool fee higher, right? So instead of being 0.3%, instead, let's set it to 3.77%, which is something that, you know, traders naively would would say is is prohibitively high, right? They, they don't want to pay that fee. They would much rather pay a 0.3% fee, not realizing that it means that they actually lose 81% of the trade value due to sandwiches. So if we set the fee to 3.77%, that same transaction of 20 ETH would have yielded 37,000 USDC, which is only about 3% less than what the naive result is, but it's 424% higher compared to the sandwiched result. And it's interesting because with that higher fee amount, the liquidity providers are, you know, they're also charging a higher fee, so they're happy. And the trader is completely free from um, from being sandwich attacked. They get more than four times the value um, than if the um, if the uh, pool fee had still been zero point three percent. And I think that that's the unintuitive result, right? If you increase the pool fee by ten x, the trader will actually get. 400 times, 400 percent more, four times more value than if the pool fee was left at 0.3 percent, um, which I yeah I, I consider it to be unintuitive. Uh, Stefan with <laughs> is more uh, more versed in um, in financial analysis than I am and said that yeah you should probably take that out because it's perfectly intuitive to me, um, but I decided to leave it in because I, I do consider the result to be a, a little bit surprising. I said increasing the fees is good for the trader and funnily enough bad for the lps possibly yeah right. <laughs> they, yeah um they obviously lose the sandwich revenues if there are no longer any sandwiches because they i mean uh, depending though the, it's always it's still one of the big mysteries to me why LPs are so bad off because in theory arbitrageurs should be uh, should be handing over much more uh, of their profit to uh, to LPs because when they're bidding against each other and it's still a mystery to me why this doesn't happen but um, you would think that the people who profit most of the sandwich attacks in the presence of fees are actually the LPs because you have different sandwich attackers possibly competing um, competing on this uh, uh, um, thing. And so they hand over 
a fair amount of their potential earnings back, they hand it back in fees to the LPs. So anyway, so that's the, the interesting thing that, yeah, higher fees, you get better execution prices for the trader, but you get less earnings for the LP. That's a very unintuitive, but very nice result. And then finally, the last analysis that I did, and I'm going to try and keep this again super brief, is to ask a, a sort of outlandish question, which is if we allow the trader to just trade larger and larger quantities, right, um, and see um, whether adjusting the fee, right, or at certain simulated fee levels, is there um, a state where it doesn't make sense to trade more than a certain amount? So if you're familiar with, you know, AMM mechanics, um, it should, I think, be trivial, or at least I hope it's not controversial, that if you trade um, an infinitely large um, amount, the maximum uh, target token that you're going to be able to receive from the pool is w whatever its balance is. And because of the asymptotic nature of bonding curves, you can never quite get all of those tokens. But if you trade an arbitrarily large amount, you can get effectively down to the last way of USDC in that pool. So if the, you know, if the liquidity pool has 500 ETH and a million USDC in it, you can trade an infinite amount of ETH into that pool and receive basically 1 million USDC minus, you know, minus epsilon, whatever that tiny amount is that's left at the, um, after the floating point precision problems, oh, sorry, after the fixed point precision problems. So essentially for very large amounts of, of, um, of trade volume in the naive case where we don't allow the trade to be, um, to be attacked, it is going to asymptotically approach that 1 million USDC return. But then the other two are going to behave a little bit differently because we now have this completely different function that either compensates for the fact that there's going to be a sandwich attack performed or a different function that introduces the necessary pool fee that would prohibit a sandwich attack from being performed. And so the question is, is there like, does it still have that asymptotic behavior? Is there like a maximum amount of USDC that you can extract from the pool? Um, it turns out there is, but it's not quite asymptotic. It's actually, um, it, it, it has a peak, right? There is a certain amount, a certain trade um, volume after which it no longer makes sense to trade, um, to trade anything else. And for the, um, for the uh, adjusted fee levels, this is exactly twice the liquidity um, of the token that you're swapping. So for the case of a, a pool with 500 ETH in it, if we're taking this you know, adjusted fee level, the maximum amount of ETH that you can swap is exactly 1,000. After that, every amount of ETH that you trade, you'll actually get back less USDC than, um, than had you traded just a, a, a smaller amount of ETH, which I mean, is, is neither here nor there, but it, I, I still think it's an important result to um, to draw attention to. Um, and it, the true is it, the same is also true of being sandwiched. Um, there is a certain amount. Let's say that you know we never had any. We lived in a parallel universe, and we don't have things like min returns or something on AMMs. Um, you might ask the question, is there a certain amount of, of stuff that I can swap knowing full well that I'm going to be sandwiched um, where my, you know, there is some maximum amount of USDC that I can get back out of that pool? Um, so the in the case of the adjusted fee, it's actually, you can show it symbolically. Um, for the sandwich attack one, I haven't been able to show it symbolically. I've only been able to, um, to perform a numerical analysis to arrive at that number, but they both have it. And then finally... You, there's uh, the the last question, which is: Is it ever more expensive for the trader to prevent a sandwich attack than to just simply be sandwich attacked? Right. In all of this analysis, all we're looking at is um, basically making um, a sandwich attack, uh, performing a sandwich attack, unprofitable. We're not performing the analysis where you know when are the profits or when is the the returns for the trader maximized. And there's a nuance there because, of course, right, if you're not being sandwiched, then your returns are higher. But for very extreme values, like if you're trading 1,000 times or 1 million times the, the size of the liquidity pool, then there might actually come a point where it is 
preferential to just be sandwiched than to, you know, hike the pool fees sufficiently high that you can't be sandwiched. And it turns out that that point exists as well. Um, and again, I haven't been able to, um, I haven't been able to show symbolically what that number is, but I have been able to um, to get there numerically. And so for a um, for a liquidity pool with 500 ETH in it, if you trade 181608.08 ETH, that's the exact point where um, paying a, a higher fee or being sandwiched is exactly the same. You get exactly the same result. And that's a, that's a huge amount, right? We're talking about a pool that's got 500 ETH and you're trading nearly 200,000 ETH into it. Um, so the, you know, the, the, the point where this analysis essentially, or, you know, from the perspective of protecting a trader, um, sort of starts to break down. Um, but yeah, it definitely, in my opinion, sort of rounds out the analysis, even though it's got no, you know, no real practical applications because that point still happens after the maxima, um, of the adjusted fee and the sandwich attack anyway. Um, but still, you know, from an academic and, um, and mathematical perspective, I think is still, um, is still worth a look. And uh, yeah, the last point in that article, um, again, I've updated the, um, the, the Python class that will allow you to perform these analyses for yourself. Um, that class um, has some methods in it that will actually produce tabulated results. Um, so if you want to, you know, create your own liquidity pools, whatever tokens you want, that kind of thing, um, and see, you know, it, maybe you are a trader and you're wondering, you know, what what are the possible what, what are the chances of me being sandwiched and that kind of thing. Um, I think that um, you know it would be beneficial um, to just spin that up in a um, in your Python environment and see what kinds of uh, what kinds of data um, it can output. Thank you guys so much. We are at the hour. I want to ask a quick question. I know we spoke about the conclusion, you know, of the actual analysis and the research that you guys were doing. Recently, we were speaking about how I think it was somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of LPs or transactions. I'm sorry, on um, I think I believe it was Uniswap V3, our sandwich attacks, right? Obviously, this is not Good for traders. Go ahead, Mark. You were gonna. Am I mistaken in saying that? No, you're not mistaken. I mean, the um, you know, the the research that you're referring to is the one by Glassnode, and sure. um, and it's had a look, and uh, it's basically estimated the uh, the the volume on um on uniswap that can be attributed to sandwich attacks is 60 percent, but it depends like it's very time dependent um when i first spoke about that research uh, you remember josh from aori called me out and said actually it's closer to 80 percent um and it really depends on um specifically where you're looking at it but i think that taking the, the low threshold is um you know is is sensible i, th I think either way 60 percent and 80 percent are still like ridiculously large numbers so it's uh you know it, it it's not so important which one is right just that we know that it, you know it's somewhere in the vicinity of two thirds to three quarters um of the um the volume on uniswap is actually um is actually traders being sandwich attacked not necessarily you know um organic volume which is nice for the lp it's nice for the LPs. Well, it's almost kind of like you're stuck between a, a rock and a hard place or a double-edged sword, right? Because one is nice for the LPs and the other is nice for the traders. You know, if something like this were implemented in AMMs, right? Obviously, the traders would benefit from this, but it would be at the expense of LPs. And I was... Well, yeah, ahead. this is this is an important point that um, I'm not actually suggesting that um that we implement something like a dynamic fee in order to prevent sandwich attacks because the the reality is um if the um if the the sandwicher knows ahead of time um you know the, how the the you know the pool fee is going to respond and this is similar to some of the attacks we've seen on um thor chain with their dynamic um fee model is that you can actually bundle just like a bunch of transactions together um, so that each one is very low slippage and so it would pay a small fee um, in order to to achieve the same thing so you can't actually you know it, there's nothing here that i think is like we should immediately inform amm design um other than for the the conclusions that are being offered there um but yeah you're right the in for for lps they don't necessarily mind sandwich attacks because um 
because it, it generates um, you know significant revenue for them. But then you have to ask the question, right? If you've got a, a this kind of cannibalistic relationship with your consumer, um, you know how sustainable is that business model? And uh, you know, in general, these things don't play out um, very well. Penetrating, right? That is the problem. Is obviously it's nice that you can prey on your taker customers via going via the um, the sandwiches and that you profit from it. But ultimately, you're probably still better off just having a higher trading volume of fair trading with no sandwich attacks and earning the fees on this. So, but there's another feedback loop that you need to consider uh, for that. Yeah, that just simply when there's a lot of sandwiches, at one point liquidity is going to suffer and no one is going to trade on your exchange. Yeah. Also in traditional finance, if you're being front run all the time in massive amounts, then you're not going to trade there anymore. A little bit of front running is okay. You deal with this. This is also to some extent liquidity, but if it gets too big, you just don't trade anymore. Mark, do you have any last comments? Um, yeah, the I guess that the you know as Stefan said at the very start, the the motivation for this work was really to um, like we can demonstrate heuristically that it's impossible to perform um, a uh, a sandwich attack on on carbon in most situations. There it, it is possible, for example, to create um, a um, you know a Uniswap V three like. Um, strategy on carbon, where the you know the bids will will come up to meet the asks and so forth, um, and this makes um, you know this means that you know, Uniswap v3 is a, a strict subset of um, of the carbon equations, um, but in you know th there are basically th th I think there's only one sort of project liquidity. Um, that b behaves this way. All of the users, um, you know, maker orders, um, all of the individuals, we should say, um, really don't have this um, this type of profile. Um, and because the the bids don't move with the asks, and you know, the protocol essentially continues to observe the user's bias, the um, you know, the, the the sandwich attack is impossible to perform. And you can you can show this. On like you know on a whiteboard um, fairly quickly, but then to have a um, a uh, you know a rigorous mathematical explanation for why that's true was lacking, and that's really why um, we sort of decided to to do this. Um, and so yeah, I just wanted to point out that the 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 motivation for this isn't to sort of you know, rip on um, on AMM designs in general, or um, you know, instruct people how to perform sandwich attacks more reliably. Although I can see that's that could be um, an un, uh, you know an unintended consequence of revealing some of this stuff. Um, but in general, the the idea here is to create um, a more robust analytical framework so that we can actually talk about this subject in a, you know in in an academically rigorous way. Thank you so much. And of course, I mean, with all of our calls, that's the the goal, right? I am for anybody who wasn't noticing, and I hope that you were, I was pinning all of the articles to the top. I've included them in the thread with the initial announcement for this call. In addition to some earlier research that Stefan and Mark had performed with a couple of other contributors in regards to impermanent loss in Uniswap V3. Um, and this is something that I was kind of alluding to earlier and you guys were saying as well, it's, you know, one is kind of at the expense of the other. And so um, if anybody here is interested in reading some of their earlier research as well, I definitely recommend taking a look at that. Um, thank you guys so much for one, I mean, just doing all of this research and sharing it with us. And then two, for getting up here and speaking about it um, as thoroughly as you have. Thank you for hosting us, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for organizing. Of course. And if anybody has any questions about it, um, about any of their research, I'm sure, Mark, you always say that your DMs are open. Stefan, I'm not sure if... You yeah, know. my DMs are open, as in not only followers or whatever. You could just also um, ask, uh, just add mention me or whatever. 
Uh, obviously, I'm on Audito, so I'm not Stefan, but we'll right. see, uh, that's in the uh, that's for historical reasons. And uh, in any way, it's clear from the uh, I guess it's clear from the from the tweet uh, tweet that you make. So should be obvious. Cool. Okay, so both their DMs are open. I also encourage anybody with questions to reply to the thread. Um, directly, and hopefully we can all learn a little bit more about this together. If you're interested in learning more about carbon, um, please join our Telegram. It's Carbon DeFi XYZ, and we have a coffee break in about three hours on the Bancor Discord. It's kind of we go through simulations, we look at charts, talk trading, talk DeFi. Um, would love to have you guys join. Thank you so much, and hopefully we'll speak with you soon.